Hi, welcome to ASAP. I'm Tracy. I'm Stacy. And I'm Michelle. What is ASAP? ASAP is Airway, Sleep, and Pediatric Pathway. We need to get to these kids ASAP. The earlier, the better. And we need as many dentists as possible, trained and educated, to get to all these kids. And that's where you come in. And that's why we developed this online pediatric airway educational form. Because the reality is the medical community does not have an answer past tonsils and adenoids. That's right, Trace. I have a lot of patients in my practice, mm -hmm. and a lot of them are still symptomatic after tonsils and adenoids have been taken out. They can't breathe through their nose, um, and they are still not sleeping well, and there are also some patients that haven't had their tonsils and adenoids removed, and we send them to the physicians, and they say, everything's fine, so what do we do? And this is where we started our journey because we all were in this situation in our practices, um, and so we started independently taking course after course after course and um, running into each other at these courses, feeling the same frustrations, um, trying to fill in the blanks in our practices and um, feeling so alone and um, trying to figure out how we do this by ourselves in our practice. And this is where we realized the more we were talking that the accumulated knowledge when we worked together, that we were actually able to help more kids in our practice mm -hmm. and by networking with each other versus on our own. Yeah, I mean, the beauty of the three of us is we're combining our education, our clinical experience, and most importantly, implementation. Because I think that's where the missing link is, is what do we do knowing what we know? Because you can't unsee what, you can't unsee it anymore. Right. And then when Once you don't you have it. the help from the medical community, you, it just stops right there. And that's it. It's the implementation, right? Because I was a CE junkie. I am a CE junkie. I take course after course after course, but I struggle to implement it in my practice. Um, and so not until we talk to each other almost every day, we network, mm -hmm. and I ran through thoughts with you guys, and I ran through things that were working, um, were working well, and I ran through things that were not quite working as well as I thought they should. Um, and you know, you were my sounding board. I was able to tweak things right. in order to implement it better in my practice. So. I mean yeah, I mean, that's kind of how the, our Sunday chat started. Yes. I mean, because we, we started, I mean, when we first met, we were just like, okay, we need to talk. And we did it via Zoom. Um, well, we texted first. We texted yes. first. And then that wasn't enough. Yes. Well, because we had to now show cases. We were like, right. this is my child. This is what's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, what next? Um, and then it just became like a weekly thing. because. Right. I mean, at the point, at some point, I felt like I was treating every sick kid in Northern Virginia. This is true. <laughs> and we had people coming to us saying, we want to be part of your Sunday chats because it was just so beneficial to share that knowledge and say, hey, did you think about this? Or, mm -hmm. you know, look at that adenoid on the, on the comb beam and things right. like that. And I think it's an implementation that a lot of people are really trying to, trying to work on and trying to um, put together in their practices because really what is education without being able to implement it yes. in your practice and being right. able to really help these kiddos which is what we want to do right so we put together this ASAP pathway um, for you um, because it's helped us uh, but if you're looking for something that is a get rich quick scheme something easy like that where you know you're just gonna see the money rolling in this program is not for you this yeah. program also isn't for you if you're thinking it's going to be this comprehensive orthodontic course. That's not what this is, and that's not for you. You're absolutely right because um, what we hope, well, what we want you to learn is a systematic way to evaluate these kids comprehensively. Do not put every kid in a box because there is no box. And I think when definitely not a program that is a get rich, give me a protocol, tell me what to do. We really want you to think through this entire process, think through every child and look at all the signs and symptoms. Right. And I think that's the benefit of our discussions mm -hmm. because in you know the questions and in actually verbalizing all of these things that we're observing, yes. yeah. we get to think through the case a little bit better. So what, we can, what we'd love to give you guys as a gift is um, Michelle is going to discuss screening 
I'm going to go into diagnosis. And I, I mean, I'm super excited about um, Stacy going into non-anatomical considerations because that's something, I mean, I learn something new every day, every time every I time. talk to you guys on Sunday Same chats. here. Same here. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's going to be our little treat for you. And we know that your time is very, valu very valuable. And we are thankful for the time that you're giving us today. So as a thank you, um, we are going to give you a gift, um, something that you can use in your practice immediately, something that can help you see things and observe and pick out those patients that have airway issues. So stay tuned until the end. Hi, I'm Michelle Weddle and I'm a general dentist. I also like to take continuing education courses, so you can call me a CD, CE addict, if you will. Um, in my journey, I have taken Panky, Dawson, Coise, and Spear courses, all the while trying to learn how to make my dentistry better and how to make it more stable. In the process um, and throughout my years of practice, I've always tried to figure out why some things work sometimes, um, but not all the time. Right? So I've kind of skipped around all these continuing education curriculums trying to figure that out when all I was really doing was circling what's in the middle, which is airway. Um, and if you put that airway puzzle in the mix, then things start to make sense. So once I realized that, I went to the Tufts Airway Mini Residency Program. Um, and then I joined Spencer Study Club, and I also joined Spencer Study Club Business Elite. Every time I come back from all of these continuing education courses, I come back on fire, excited, wanting to share my knowledge, not only to my staff, but to my patients. So what I would do is I would go to the hygiene chair, usually, during a checkup, and I'd sit down, I'd see something, and then I'd go through my whole airway spiel, and then my hygienist is standing behind the patient going, time, you know? So I'm running hygiene behind constantly because of my excitement. So that's one of the things that I feel like is a stressor in the practice. And it's one of my biggest mistakes earlier in practice. So what I'd like to share with you today is a quick screening tool at the hygiene chair to try to figure out whether the child in front of you has an airway issue or not whether it's something that needs to be addressed or not. So here we go. There are four considerations when you're looking at a child and we're, when you're trying to figure out whether airway is part of what they're experiencing. Number one, bruxism. Number two, craniofacial structure. Number three, mouth breathing. Number four, speech. And number five, posture while awake and asleep. So bruxism, which you know a lot of people kind of know now, could be a compensation for an airway issue. And when you have a child who's basically doing their own root canal access, it's pretty clear that they're grinding their teeth. So that's kind of a sign. You know, it's one of the things that's right in your face, on the teeth, very easy to spot. So at that point, things should be kind of turning in your head, gears should be turning in your head, um, and you should be kind of looking for other signs that may indicate that this child might have an airway issue. The second is a craniofacial structure. So there are studies now that show that in children, it's not really obesity that is playing a role in airway issues or obstructive sleep apnea, but it's actually craniofacial morphology, which, you know, as dentists, this is what we work with, right? So it's tonsillar hypertrophy presents with 3.7 times a risk of a child having an airway issue versus not. Crossbite, 3.3 times. Convex facial profile, 2.6 times. And obesity, not really correlated. When we look at the back of the throat of a child, um, we can see all the way back what is going on. So we can grade these tonsils Zero being the tonsils have already been removed. One being the tonsils are not too far out of those side, um, side walls, the pharyngeal walls. Two, the tonsils extend a little bit more towards uh, 
in, in towards the middle. Three tonsils are beyond the filler, pillars, and four tonsils extend in the midline, and this is what they call kissing tonsils. Crossbite. So in this patient, you can see a posterior crossbite, and a lot of times the crossbite is unilateral, right? But you can also see unilateral means it's on one side, but not on the other. But then if you look at the midline, you'll see that there's actually a midline shift. So if you try to correct the midline, you'll pretty much appreciate a lot of the times that this, that the patients that you have will actually have a bilateral crossbite. Um, and what they do is they kind of shift to one side, making it look like they have um, a unilateral crossbite just because they need teeth to drive together on that other side that's not in crossbite. So it's a compensation, right? But this is also another crossbite. We can see that this patient has an anterior crossbite, but then if you look at the back teeth, you can actually see that they're inclined inwards. So if you imagine those teeth kind of becoming a little bit more upright, can you appreciate that these are actually crossbite that are a little bit masked? And then the last one is convex facial profile, which is that chin is retrognathic, that mandible is far back. Right, so we can see all this in the dental chair. We can see this within the first, I don't know, two minutes of an exam. Mouth breathing. Somebody coming in with an open mouth posture. Nine times out of 10, they're mouth breathing. And then definitely with chap lips, they're mouth breathing. Number four, speech. Who thinks more is better than less? Okay, why? More is better than less because if stuff is not less, if there's more less stuff, then you might you might want to have some more, and your parents just don't let you because there's only a little. Bit. Right. We, we want more. We want more. Like you really like it. You right. want more. So if you talk to your patients and ask them questions, you can appreciate how they pronounce their words, how they breathe whether they're breathing through their nose, whether they're breathing through their mouth, or whether they're running out of breath. So those are actually other clues, whether the patient has a blocked nasal airway, their mouth breathing, has tongue issues that they can't pronounce their words properly. Again, yay or nay, is there maybe a problem or is there nothing to be concerned about? That's all we're asking here, right? And the fifth one is posture. And posture while awake, of course you can see, and posture while asleep, we can ask the patient or the parents. So if your child patient walks in and they're walking in, shoulders forward, head kind of postured forward, maybe tilted up, you know, a lot of times it's actually more common nowadays because of the cell phone use, uh, but many times it's also an airway compensation. So it's not an absolute positive that this child has an airway issue. This particular child actually does, but not everybody who has a forward head posture has an airway issue. But that's just another clue that this patient may have an airway issue. And then sleeping, you know, it's one of those things that you can ask the patients or the parent, do they sleep in weird positions, right? Is the head kind of extended back, is the neck flexed? Um, you can also ask, do they sweat while they're sleeping or they do, do they move around a lot when they're sleeping? Do they sleep in one position and wake up in another position? Are the covers thrown out of the bed? So those are just clues that there's something going on. Note that I didn't say sleepiness, right? Because a lot of kids actually don't have excessive daytime sleepiness as a, as a symptom. So it's one of those things that I don't always ask in the initial screening. I will ask it later if I have a suspicion, um, but in the initial screening, you kind of want to just keep everything to what you want to see, what you can see, and also what can be quickly asked of the parent. Um, so I don't really ask about sleepiness. So all of these things, bruxism, craniofacial structure, mouth breathing, speech, and posture while awake, of course, and then a quick question about their sleep posture can be pretty much uh, summarized and found out in about five minutes. So then you don't have to make your hygiene um, schedule late. All right, thanks.
Hi, I'm Tracy Wynn, and you probably know me through social media. A couple years ago, I made my page public because I was on a mission. My mission was to educate my dental colleagues on their role in treating children with sleep disordered breathing. What I did in my local area is I developed an interdisciplinary team filled with ENTs, sleep physicians, myofunctional therapists, and every single discipline in dentistry, orthodontists, periodontists, pediatric dentists, with the restorative dentists, and the oral surgeon. One of the beauties of working with this team is I actually look at everything now. Um, and I've learned so much with all these different, with all these doctors in my team. If you send me a case, the first thing I'm going to say is, what is the diagnosis? And there's so many things, tools that we have today to help you with the diagnosis. One of my favorite is drug-induced sleep endoscopy. And what that is, is basically the ENT puts a scope through your nose, down your throat, and you're asleep and we evaluate the collapse. Now, it is not a regularly covered medical procedure. and not everyone can get it covered, but if you can get this, this does wonders for your treatment options. Because really it's about having precision treatment based on your diagnosis. Because we cannot put all of these kids in a box and treat them the same. And the challenge is because we don't know the collapse, we don't know what we're doing is working. But I'll tell you a little bit about the collapse. So here we go. This is uh, vellum collapse. The vellum collapse deals with the soft palate. So that is a collapse that's a little bit higher. We, I actually see this quite a bit in children and this is where the melon potty score becomes really important for me. If you have a melon potty score of a four, I'm kind of thinking you probably have some kind of a vellum collapse. Another collapse, the oral pharyngeal lateral collapse. This collapse is very common and can be managed with oral appliance therapy. Now, there's a couple other collapses. Tongue-based collapse. Now, some are saying that if we bring the mandible forward, we can prevent the tongue collapse. Maybe. This is where hypoglossal nerve stimulation is getting a lot of rave because that is managing the tongue-based collapse. The fourth collapse, epiglottis collapse. That is really low. We can't manage that. That is all in ENT. The challenge is when we're treating these kids, when things don't work, why don't they work? So that's why I'm always gonna ask, why didn't it work and what is your diagnosis? What do we know about obstruction? Well, we know that it involves a lot of sites, and we know that the two numbers, the number two sites is the palate and the tongue. So that vellum collapse is very common, and that tongue-based collapse is really common. What makes it even worse with kids is it's very common to have multiple sites of collapse. Are you frustrated yet? Don't be. I'm only telling you this because this is why we cannot put kids in a box and treat kids all the same. We need to recognize that there may be more than one collapse. And this is where you have to grab your team. You need to get an ENT. You need to get a sleep physician. You need to get a myofunctional therapist. And then you need the support of your community and your dental colleagues. I love CBCT imaging, but CBCT imaging is not diagnostic of airway function and breathing. It is one still shot. But what do I love about CBCT imaging? I can see tonsils and adenoids. I can see the oral volume space and the tongue space. So I look at that a lot. So if I see a child and there's a tongue bubble and that is like a little black space in that oral volume space, I'm thinking if I can get the tongue to fill this entire space, it's going to be outside the airway. If I have a case where there is no oral volume space, I'm a little bit concerned. Why? Because the tongue does not fit. The last thing is obviously the spine. Many things we can learn about the spine, look at the curvature of the spine. You can tell the age by looking at the spine. 
So there are a lot of good diagnostic tools we can get from CBCT imaging, but just because you have a small airway doesn't mean you have an airway problem. I've seen many children with large airways still is collapsible. And that's why I want you not to put these kids in a box. So what did I learn? So this is a case. The, this is a case of an eight-year-old boy that walks into my office. This eight-year-old boy, skinny eight-year-old boy, walks into my office, referred from the pediatric sleep center. He had his tonsils and adenoids taken out at six, but the symptoms came back. So, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, what are the guidelines? First line of defense, tonsils and adenoids. Second, CPAP therapy. So the recommendation was CPAP therapy. Mom did not want CPAP therapy. Third recommendation, corticosteroids. Mom did not want the child onto drugs. But what ended up happening was the child was not getting any better. So, we, so when he walked into my office, he's an eight-year-old kid that has been diagnosed with sleep that's been diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea at the age of six that did not resolve, and now he's on a CPAP. So the question, how do we get him off the CPAP? So my first question was, what's the diagnosis? Where is the collapse? What can I do? So let's look at the first picture. Like I said, CBCT imaging is not diagnostic of airway function, but what it does tell me is that look at the picture. There is no air bubble where the tongue, where the tongue fits. What that tells me is the tongue does not fit. It is too big for the oral volume space. So as a dentist, when I look at that, I'm going to think tongue doesn't fit, jaws are too small, face is, mid face is set back. And ENT is going to say, it's just a large tongue. So what's the diagnosis? We both have different diagnoses. So what I asked for, I would love for you to do a DICE, drug-induced sleep endoscopy. I want to know where the collapse is. I want to know if what I'm going to do is even going to work. And the answer for this child is really CPAP therapy. So this is what we did. I taught my ENT how to use a George gauge while the child is under. So with the scope, she's going to put the scope down the nose through the airway and we're going to look at the collapse. Fortunately, his collapse was an oral pharyngeal lateral collapse. In adults, we manage that with oral appliance therapy. We bring the lower jaw forward and we held it there. So that was huge for me because I can if this was an adult, I can manage this adult. But it's not an adult. It's a child. Are you going to put an oral appliance on a nine-year-old? So what did I do? She did, the di she did the dice. She did the George gauge. She locked it in. I took it in. I mounted the case. And once I mounted the case, I knew where the lower jaw needed to be. Thankfully, the lower jaw just need to be about two to three millimeters. But with the lower jaw being two to three millimeters, where was the maxilla? The maxilla was too far back. How do you know? So that's the answer. You need to know where you're going before you make these recommendations. Because if this was a vellum collapse, the soft palate collapse, that has to do with a melancholy score. I would probably be talking to an ENT about, this is a soft palate issue. Or is it the tongue going up against a soft palate? So these are things you have to work with your team about. You can't do this alone. What did I learn from this case? You have to learn to co-diagnose. The, the diagnosis here was obstructive sleep apnea with lateral collapse, mid-face retronathic, nocturnal bruxism, poor tongue tone and posture. That's a lot of dentistry. I think we can help this child. So what did I do? I put him in a bonded, bonded expander with a reverse pull face mask because I had to bring the maxilla forward because the mandible needed to be three millimeters forward. And then we're gonna do myofunctional therapy and when he's old enough, 
based on the stages. Then we're going to do functional appliances. And our next step would to make sure the mandible follows. Again, I cannot stress enough how important it is for us to learn how to co-diagnose. What is the diagnosis? Many of you know this case. This mother has over 300,000 shares. This is her journey to getting treatment for her child. Her child was about to be diagnosed with ADHD. A dentist told this mother, you know, your child's ground down through his baby teeth. I wonder if he has a sleep problem. Nobody's told her that. She goes, huh, I didn't think about that. She goes to the sleep physician. Sure enough, he has obstructive sleep apnea. Next step, tonsils and adenoids. Guess what? He still has obstructive sleep apnea after tonsils and adenoids. What did they do? They went to a preformed appliance and to, their goal was to treat his mouth breathing. So, which is not a bad diagnosis because I think we have to address the function. But guess what else? He wasn't getting any better. This is the challenges of treating these children. We have to know when to switch gears. It doesn't mean what we did didn't matter because no one's going to say the child did not need the tonsils and adenoids. We just have to say that wasn't enough. So tonsils and adenoids came out, evaluated the function. He's in a preformed myofunctional device. He's learning how to nasal breathe, but he's still symptomatic. This is his clinical presentation. If you really look at the arches, it's kind of narrow. I mean, it's kind of, it's broad right where the molars are, but it really gets narrow by the canines. He can breathe through his nose. He had the tonsils and adenoids taken out. But remember my last case when we put the kid through dice and we did the George gauge? That mandible needed to be three millimeters forward to prevent a collapse. I think that's what's going on here. The function is good. There's no obstruction and there's no soft tissue obstruction. But the issue is, what else is going on? Is there enough room for his tongue? You can't tell that with this picture. So what do I look at? CBCT imaging. I always look at this. Again, it's just one small piece of the puzzle. So if you look at this, actually there's an air bubble there. So, but in the other image, it completely covers over. So what I, when I look at this, I'm thinking, there's space, he's not as bad as my first kid, but we still, I think he needs more space. I think we need to be a little bit more proactive with his treatment. So I'm not saying tonsils and adenoids was not a good decision. I'm not saying these preformed myofunctional devices was not a good decision. I'm saying, is we need to continue to do more. And so what did we do in this case? I actually treated very similar to um, my last case because the diagnosis is very similar. Obstructive sleep apnea. He still has obstructive sleep apnea. Nocturnal bruxism. He's still grinding at night. Now, I think that he is mid-face retronethic. I think that mandible is still set too far back. Unfortunately, I couldn't get a dice in this case. So I'm gonna treat this like it was a lateral collapse. I'm gonna bring the lower jaw forward and the upper jaw forward. So my treatment, upper expander, reverse pull face mask, and then a lower expander. Once that is where it needs to be, functional devices to bring him forward. He's only eight. I'm not saying that's gonna be it. I'm not saying he's not gonna need treatment anymore but I just want to keep that airway patent because every minute the child does not breathe is a risk of neurocognitive damage. We just did a tonsils and adenoid surgery that puts a child at, at the risk is death, but we did it. And it's, it's not that it didn't work, it just wasn't enough. And this is what I really want you guys to understand. If it doesn't work, it's okay. It doesn't mean it didn't work. It probably means it's just not enough. 
So I'm going to end it with what is your diagnosis? And that's what I'm going to go into in some of these modules is to go hone in on your diagnosis. You can try something just like we did with tonsils and adenoids. We tried tonsils and adenoids and it didn't work and that's okay. And I'm going to show you other techniques that we can try. Thank you. So I think a lot of people are familiar with the anatomical aspects of sleep, but there are non anatomical factors that affect sleep and airway health. Um, and what could we be missing? Is it possible that vitamin D, vitamin Bs, as well as the endocannabinoid system could actually have a role in our sleep health? Um, what could my two kids admitted into a hospital on the same day in two different parts of the country have to do with vitamin D. My one son, who has the ice pack on his, on his neck, had his tonsils and adenoids removed on March 22nd of 2018, and that picture's at 1 p.m. He was diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea, and I have done everything, expansion, myofunctional therapy, buteco breathing. Uh, finally, I'm like, I just have to get those tonsils and adenoids out. So at one o'clock, I'm at the hospital in St. Louis, Missouri with him. We get him home. I'm home an hour and I get a phone call from the uh, head of the high school choir. My son was on a choir trip in New York City and he had just arrived around four o'clock in New York. And at 5.30, the chaperones are blowing up my phone Again, another phone call. You don't want to see all these chaperones calling your phone as a mom. Uh, everything's okay. Ben's on an ambulance. He's heading to uh, the hospital. We think he had a grand mal seizure. And this is as a mom where you're like helpless. Two of my sons are in the hospital at the same time and I don't know what to do. Um, he's never had a seizure before. So here I am looking at my kids, feeling helpless, going, what am I missing? Could low vitamin D in pregnancy affect the role of sleep and airway health in infants and children? So I came across Dr. Stasha Gamanak. She is a neurologist who really focused her practice on sleep health. Um, and she has really taken me under her wing and really taught me a lot. Uh, basically, vitamin D is not a vitamin. It's really a hormone. And it has become accepted as a hormone in the, in the research. There's plenty of literature out there supporting that. We also know that if our levels are below 60 to 80 nanograms, that our sleep cannot be optimal. Uh, babies that are born to mothers with low vitamin D um, sometimes can have a hard time breathing through their nose. This is why infants might be born mouth breathers. It affects sleep, it affects their airway, and it affects their overall health. Pregnant women should have their D levels checked before they even become pregnant, ideally three months before conception, so that they can have the optimal health and sleep for themselves, and then their babies could be born with optimal sleep health. We know that sleep disorders can be viewed as basically a malfunction of either the timing of sleep or the paralysis, paralysis of sleep. Um, uncontrolled clinical trial of vitamin D supplementation, it was about 1,500 patients over a two-year period. When they, they found that maintaining a consistent D level um, between 60 to 80 nanograms, again, way higher than what the average medical doctor is used to, uh, used to saying as normal, over many, many months, uh, produce normal sleep in these patients with sleep disorders, regardless of the type of sleep disorder they had, whether it was obstructive sleep apnea, whether it was narcolepsy, a lot of them improved just through normalizing the D levels. What we also know is that patients that manifest these certain sleep disorders, whether it's periodic, periodic limb movements or whether it's obstructive sleep apnea, 
um, during the same sleep study, one might see that someone experiences both of these things. One is that you're not paralyzed enough during sleep, which would be the periodic limb movements. The other is you're too paralyzed during sleep, and that is the obstructive sleep apnea. So you wobble between too paralyzed and not paralyzed enough. And what is interesting is acetylcholine, which comes from B5 in the gut, which comes from a healthy vitamin D level. You can't have the Bs if you don't have a good D level. Acetylcholine controls the brainstem. It controls the toggle switch between paralyzed and too paralyzed and not paralyzed enough during certain phases of sleep. The vitamin D receptor access is throughout our entire body. Um, and low D leads to low levels of vitamin Bs. And this can lead to quite a few problems in our health. And here's just a few um, that I'm, I'm gonna mention. Poor sleep, insomnia, narcolepsy, cataplexy, kineoplexy, apnea, parasomnia, restless leg, bruxism, lack of growth hormone during sleep because you're not getting good stage three sleep, decreased acetylcholine, which we know how important acetylcholine is in keeping our um, toggle switch perfect between paralyzed and not too paralyzed, inflammation states, poor gut health, IBS, constipation, acid reflux, B12 deficiencies, poor vagal tone, kidney stones, osteoporosis, gallstones, infertility, PCOS, gender confusion. Do any of these sound like you've heard this in your practice before or in your family? Diabetes, increased weight gain from an increased appetite from your gut health being so off because your vitamin D is so low that your gut went into a hibernation state and you begin to gain weight. Migraines, headaches, seizure increases in epilepsy, preterm birth, links to autism, autis autistic spectral issues, um, nose obstructed children, babies born with uh, the inability to breathe through their nose from day one, increasing rates of skin cancer. Yes, vitamin D actually protects you from skin cancer, but we're avoiding the sun like the plague today. Low D levels cause a decrease in the endocannabinoid um, hormones that are made in the gut. And we know the endocannabinoid system is gaining a lot of ground with its role in sleep and inflammation. So let's go back to the original question I asked. What could my two kids being admitted into the hospital on the same day for two totally different reasons have to do with low vitamin D? Both of the issues my children were battling were a result of a sleep disorder and low vitamin D. Um, my son who had his tonsils and adenoids out in the picture that day when I had his vitamin D tested, his D level was 26. Um, very far from the 60 to 80 that it needs to be for optimal sleep health, for his airway to be able to maintain patency during sleep. My other son had his very first grand mal seizure in his entire life after a 24 hour bus ride that all the other students did pretty, pretty okay with. But my son battled headaches and migraines for the whole year prior to this grand mal seizure. His vitamin D level was 22. Basically through this program, I have been able to get their vitamin D levels up my um, son, Judah, who had the tonsils and adenoids out, he went from a 26D up to a 79D. My son with the, had the grand mal seizure, he went from a level of 22 with his vitamin D to a 76. And here's what's changed. Both of their D levels are in the 70s. Um, and there wasn't a medical doctor on the planet that even said, you know, maybe we should check their D level because it could affect their sleep and could be what's going on in their lives. Both of their sleep is markedly improved. I mean, dramatically. My youngest is much easier to wake up. 
Um, even he says, I feel less angry in the morning and he was a bear. He was difficult to wake up. And now when I knock on his door, I say, Judah, he says, yep, I'm up. And it's a, that's a big difference for what it was like. My oldest went from two to three debilitating migraines a week where he was vomiting and literally was sleeping for an entire night just to function the next day. When his D level hit the mid sixties, his headaches went from those debilitating migraines two to three times a week with emergency migraine medication to one headache in maybe three months that he could just take Excedrin for. And you know, my 16 year old would love to prove me wrong. He'd love to prove me wrong. And he would even stand here and tell you, my sleep is different, mom. So it's not just D, it's what does D do for us as humans? And it is for our overall health, but it is super imperative for our sleep health. Um, we have a lot to learn still about D. We're just touching uh, the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of research coming out um, about the role of D in every aspect of our health as humans. Um, but it shows us that there's so much more to the airway sleep complex than just, you know, a jaw, a tongue, keeping that airway open with a device. Um, there is a key between sleep and airway health and vitamin D has a role with that. And I'd love to go over deeper with you in the ASAP program to help you understand how you need to be checking this in your practice with your patients. So who am I and why would you listen? Um, I'm an airway dentist uh, and these are my kids and I'm a parent before anything else. And I, I really wanted answers for what I was going through in my life. And I know this picture, I mean, we really are walking around like this all the time, arm in arm, perfectly happy, never arguing. That's my family. Actually, that's from a few years ago. And um, those kids pretty much tower over me right now. So I haven't had an updated one, but it's a good picture. So this is, this is my why. Um, my journey is pretty much probably your journey too. When I speak, when I lecture, I can't tell you all the people that come up to me and say, that's what I've gone through. That's what I'm going through. So I think um, a lot of us share this together. So my name is Stacy Ochoa. I'm a diplomate with the American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine. I started my airway journey about 16 years ago when my dad was CPAP intolerant. Um, he had severe apnea, so I didn't fully resolve my dad with an oral appliance, but it was better than nothing, and he had no options because he couldn't wear his CPAP. Uh, we tried every device under the sun until we finally found one that worked for him. Um, and again, some treatment's better than no treatment at all. Then I became a mom, and I started to see that my kids struggled with a lot of the things that my dad was struggling with, and all five of the kids in our home have some form of upper airway resistance, obstructive sleep apnea, sleep disordered breathing, and as a mom, I needed answers. And so my rabbit hole journey began. I started realizing um, course after course after course that there's so much more to airway, and I felt like I could never get enough information. Um, I was traveling constantly, if not every month for the last three years, it was sometimes twice a month. And I remember my dad saying to me, sis, he always called me sis, sis, why are you leaving so much? Why are you going out of town and going away from your family? You know, you, you need to be home more. And I said, dad, I got to help these kids. I mean, these are my babies. These are your grandbabies. They have crowded teeth, narrow arches. They can't breathe through their nose. They're bedwetting. They're sick. They're tired. And I don't want them to have, to go through the same thing you're going through in your life. And my dad's response was, well, sis, I've never been able to breathe through my nose. I went to bed till I was about 12 years old and I was always tired. And I asked my mom to get out some pictures of my dad and I looked at my dad and I thought, oh my gosh, he did. He was always breathing through his mouth. He was, um, he struggled, he struggled breathing. Um, and I thought, nope, 
this isn't going to happen. I can't let this happen to my kids. I have to intervene. So I was going to another course. I'm on the plane, buckled in and head back and relaxed and uh, the phone keeps ringing and I basically I'm getting ready to take off. I'm not going to take a call and I see it's my brother and I keep swiping, decline, call and he keeps calling me. And you know, you have that moment when you know that I think if I answer this phone, my life is going to change right now because something's not right. So I pick up the phone. I'm like, hi. And he said, where are you? I said, I'm sitting on a plane. He said, are you flying? I said, no, we haven't taken off. Why? What's going on? Is everything okay? And he said, I don't know how to tell you this. But dad, dad passed away today. And I'm thinking to myself, first of all, you, you, when you hear those words, you cannot believe that that's what you're hearing. And then I couldn't believe it also because we all were on a group text today with dad and uh, talking about his birthday. That was Sunday and how I'm going to come back from my trip. We'll all get together Sunday night and celebrate his 64th birthday. And basically what happened, it was Valentine's Valentine's Day, the day before, February 14th of 2017. And my dad and mom had a Valentine's Day together. And he went to bed. And my mom would always say, Dan, put in your device. Because he'd start falling asleep and he'd start snoring. And he said, just, just give me a minute. I just want to lay here and relax. And she said that usually he would get up and he'd put his device in. And that night... He didn't. That night, my dad left my sleep device that I made for him on the bathroom sink. So he didn't wake up. And I owe so much to my dad for this journey because he was my teacher. He was the one that got me on this pathway and he was my hero. And then I really stepped back in my practice, in my life, and I said, it's not just enough to treat the adults. We have to get to these kids because I really felt helpless. Like, what could I have done? My heart was breaking for my dad. My heart's breaking for my kids. I don't have a time machine to go back and help my dad. So what am I going to do? The only thing I can do is help make my kids' lives better and help make other kids' lives better and prevent some of these morbidities that my dad had a struggle with in his life. Um, and it really changed the entire course of my practice. We can make the biggest impact the earlier we identify the problem as soon as possible. And that's why we have ASAP. And I am here to help you, to help you with your family, to help you with the children in your practice. And if we can help one child breathe better by educating a dentist to start screening and helping, then it's all worth it. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story. I don't think that I'm the only one that has this story. I think this is also possibly your story. I know that Tracy and Michelle share in my story as well. Um, so we're bringing this to you to join us in our journey to help as many people as possible.